interviewing Rick Pajewski, um, and he is running, as we know, for the Pennsylvania House of Representatives for the 188th district, which is our district at West Philly. Sorry for popping a picture of you in there, Rick. But oh, yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> I also have pictures of the students in case they hadn't signed the forms, um, so you could kind yeah. of put a place to the name. Um, so my kids are probably gonna um, be mad at me for some of the pictures I put in in a couple minutes. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but we are here. Um, it is all seniors in this interview. Um, so thank you guys again for joining us. Um, make sure you introduce yourself before you ask your questions and then we'll give you some time to respond. All right, Mr. McLaren, whenever you're oh, ready. Wow. So my name is Deshaun McLaren. I feel like I feel like a lot of voting for the politicians has to play with like upbringing mm -hmm. and relatability. So mm -hmm. my first question was like, what is your upbringing and how many years do you have in politics? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Deshaun. Um, and great to meet all of you also. Sorry we can't have this kind of event physically, but I'm glad to be able to have a virtual virtual gathering. Mm -hmm. um, so my background, so uh, just for context, I'm 28 years old. Um, I've spent my whole adult life here in Philly and here in West Philly in particular. Um, I'm originally actually from the South Bronx in mm -hmm. New York City. Um, so I was born and raised in the South Bronx. And that was an important experience for my entering into politics and becoming involved in community engagement because uh, living in the neighborhood that I was in, there were these two things that I was witnessing. One was, um, if you know a little bit about hip hop and hip hop history, it's the mm -hmm. South Bronx is one of the places that hip hop yeah, originated from. Had like DJ parties in the 70s and the 80s. My mom used to go to them uh, when she was a teenager and, and, a, and an adult. Um, so I would remember hearing stories about, you know, these old heads like Grandmaster Flash uh, and the Fears Five. And my, my, my mom just talking about going to these parties like it was nothing. Um, so I had that one piece of, of the culture and like being in a place where culture was really important for community and music and art and expression. And that was really important. But then on the other hand, uh, the community I grew up in, it was a low income majority black and brown community. Uh, we were dealing with not having sufficient funding for like our public resources, our parks, our schools, uh, dealing with mass incarceration, with over policing. Um, I can always remember, you know, growing up here in Sirens, like on a pretty regular occasion. So I also saw that, you know, my community was being treated much differently than other communities that I would that I would witness and, and be in. Um, that was an experience I carried with me. Uh, my mom, I was raised in a single income, single parent household with my mom. Um, I mentioned I'm Polish. My dad uh, left our family when I was pretty young. So I was raised primarily by my mom. Uh, and she recognized I was smart from an early age, which, I, which I'm thankful for. And so she uh, sent me to a, a scholarship program that specifically targeted low-income students that were bright. Uh, and that was how I went to a uh, private school on scholarship. And I came here to Philly in 09 to attend the University of Pennsylvania. I graduated uh, from there. And then that's how I've been spending, I spent my whole life in Philly since since then. So just coming up on about 11 years being, being in Philly. I like uh, that. I like that. I mean, Talking like that, I might just have to vote for you. I might, you okay. might just take my vote. I like Aaron, that. I got like your vote. Great. Yeah, you, you, you might. You might. <laughs> All right, well, hold on. Let me answer the second part so, that's like, so I can seal the deal. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, in terms of my, my involvement in politics, when it comes to our community, I, I first started getting involved in, in this kind of stuff in 2015. Um, so, I went to, to school actually for engineering, uh, electrical engineering in particular. I worked as a computer programmer for a couple of years in the industry. Um, but then in 2015, I, I had this moment where I wanted to basically share the educational knowledge that I was privileged enough to receive to, to schools and to kids that weren't getting access to them, uh, particularly right around, around STEM topics, uh, because I knew that because I was fortunate enough to go to a well-resourced school and then to go to a school like UPenn, I was exposed to, to materials and resources around engineering, around technology that that often, you know, particularly low income students of color don't get exposed to enough at an early age. So I wanted to get involved to start to uh, bridge that inequality 
So I started teaching on my volunteer time at a, a school called Huey Elementary School that was uh, right across the street from Malcolm X Park over on 52nd and Pine. Uh, I taught fifth and sixth graders introductory computer programming. I did that for six months until uh, Huey became charterized and became Global Leadership Academy, uh, at which point my program was discontinued, which was uh, a really a really hard experience for me because I was really engaging with the kids. They were enjoying the material. I was really, we were really like building a connection and then it got, it got just pulled out mm -hmm. when, when the school had to shut down because it was struggling around funding. So uh, that was one involvement with, with local issues. I also started getting involved in, in local elections uh, starting in 2016 because of the election of Donald Trump, right? And me as a young black man, feeling very concerned uh, for my safety and in a society where our president was saying really hateful stuff. Yeah, um, I've seen that. Right, and then on the other hand, I was really excited by the campaign of Bernie Sanders who ran in 2016 and ran again in 2017, uh, ran a really strong campaign around a message that was about connecting all kinds of people that were being, uh, that were being exploited by, by the, the current political system. And that was, that was a new engaging experience for me. So after that election, I became involved with a local organization here called Reclaim Philadelphia, which is a progressive grassroots organization that does work around local politics. Um, so since then I've, I've done uh, work on campaigns like the district attorney election uh, for Larry Krasner in 2017, which was an important election for mass incarceration and ending mass incarceration. I've worked for city council candidates uh, to get better judges elected to, to, to our, our courts as well. So I'm um, coming up on about, you know, five, six years of, of my, uh, pretty much my, my adult life post-college uh, becoming involved in, in local issues and politics here, here in our city. I like that, educated, educated. All right. It's a, big, it's a big thing to have right there. Um, you getting closer? You getting closer to getting the vote? <laughs> uh, this, this, this next question might just do it. It might just okay. do it. Okay. Okay. Let's, Let's see. <laughs> um, the next question is basically like out of curiosity, you know, like so many like worldly problems happening. You know I mean, I just really kind of want to see like where your priorities lie at, you know? So like it, it's basically, you know, what's one this worldly disparity that you prioritize to fix? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 yeah. hundred percent. Um, to me, it's, it's hard to pick one, but if I, if I had to say the one that really uh, at my core is, is important to me, it would be education. Uh, just because I, I know firsthand how much, how pretty much privileged I got and I was lucky, right? Like I was lucky to get access to get educational resources. And I know that throughout our city and particularly here in our, in our neighborhood in West Philly, that that is not the case, that many of our schools are struggling with funding. Uh, we're having safe conditions. We're having enough materials with class sizes that are too big. Uh, and I, that to me, that's that's morally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Like our children, every every kid, no matter what your race, your class, your background is, should be able to have access to equitable, good, well-resourced education. And that is very much clearly not the case right now in our city. Right? We have some kids who are lucky. And fortunate to go to good schools and get and get great great resources. Um, I'm, I'm really I'm glad to see that y'all are really engaging in these issues in an important way. Uh, but there are many kids who who are being left behind, and that is the responsibility of our government to fix. It is especially around public education. Public education is the responsibility of our politics to actually prioritize. So that would be the one I would say is definitely number one. I like that. My last question, the missed off the record. I just gotta ask. Oh, hold up. Listen, okay, okay. This was on the PowerPoint. All right, let's go. Let's hear it. You know, I just want to know when is voting? Like, give me for this. For the election, so the election date is June second. You know um, what? June second, mm -hmm. you got my vote, Mister Kajuski. All right, there we you go. Got my vote. Thank you, Deshaun. So here's the thing, though, real quick, and we we might talk about this again, but um, if you are voting, we're trying to get people to register to vote by mail uh, because of how you know, quarantine and things like that. Um, so if you are planning on voting, please I ask you to register to vote by mail if you haven't already. Got you. Okay. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, thank you.
I don't like this picture, it's a great, but that's okay. Hello, my name is Brittany Hall, and I'm a high school senior at West Philadelphia High School. And right, I just have Brittany. simple questions. Um, being as though, you, as we all know, education plays an important role in a person's life uh, and in society today, I just want to know what will you do to ensure education to ensure that education is more tailored to students' individual needs and empowers active learners that feel ownership of their own academic journey? Yeah, 100%. Uh, thank you, that's a great question. So uh, the big thing that we talk a lot about when it comes to our education system is the fact that it is uh, under-resourced. So uh, many kids don't have the kind of individual attention that would come with having things like more social workers that are in our schools that are trained to support kids and children, um, having more paraprofessionals, right? People that can support as teachers aides that are actually being paid adequately to, because, you know, part of being able to do the job that you need and that you, um, you, you're driven to do is being adequately compensated for it. So having better funding for paraprofessionals, better funding for teachers, um, having more uh, cultural understanding on the behalf of teachers, right? And making sure that teachers understand the needs of their students as well, right? It's, a, it's definitely a two-way street. So to me, the, that first piece is about having staff that is being adequately compensated and adequately staffed yeah. for our schools so that kids can get the individual attention. Because if you have more staff, then you have smaller class sizes, which means that more kids can get that individual attention versus when you have a class size that's too big, you know, sometimes the teacher is playing half teacher, half caretaker, half babysitter, right? Um, so that's a big part of the problem. When it comes to, ac so, sorry, did you say something? No. Oh, okay, might have been background noise. Uh, and then for active learners, yeah, I mean, I think this is also a piece around expanding the opportunities that, that children have outside the classroom too, right? So after school programs, making sure that those are being adequately funded, that, they're, that they have a, a variety of opportunities. Um, this also to me extends to some of our public resources, right? Like when I was a kid, the rec center, the local parks, um, these things that were parts of the community were also ways for me to engage around my curiosity and learning as a kid, right? Because you have programming at your local parks and your rec centers, you have, you also have like educational classes. So to me, it's about also having after school programs at the school that, that, are, that are there for, for children that are more active and wanna take their learning to the next level. But also, right, our public resources need to be places where kids and, and young people can go and, and get a, a enriching curriculum. So those would be my, my answers. That's great. Um, my second question is, what is your intake on poverty in the Philadelphia area and how do you plan on helping resolve the issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, this is a really big issue for Philly. Um, Philadelphia, I love Philly, I love the city. Um, I love that you know we're, we're tough people, but part of why we're tough is because a lot of us are struggling with, with poverty, right? Um, and Philadelphia is like one of the biggest, most impoverished cities in the whole country. And there's a few reasons for why that's happening. One is that Pennsylvania's minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. That's crazy. And there's no reason anyone should be paying, being paid $7.25 an hour for, for work that they're doing. Everyone's work is much more valuable than that. Um, it's one of the lowest minimum wages in the whole country. And in a city with over a million people, that's you just can't you can't live on that. So part of it is addressing the minimum wage, raising the minimum wage to be at least at least fifteen dollars an hour. Um, that is that is this, the floor that I believe is as acceptable for for paying people uh, a fair wage in our city. But also, right, we have to make sure that we have uh, expanded jobs for people. Um, that we have a lot of job opportunities across a bunch of different sectors like our education sector, but also um, even thinking about our climate and our environment. One of the things our, our city also deals with, right, is a lot of poor environmental issues. Um, some of y'all may have already been affecting this with like, you know, the unclean air. You know, I myself, I've acquired asthma because of the air quality in our city. Some of you may have, have as well. Um, we have a lot of toxic sites that need to be cleaned up. 
So we can pay people good paying jobs to also clean our environment and to clean our infrastructure so that you can get people out of poverty too. Thank you. you have to address that. And then the last little piece I'll say too is that part of the problem is the way that our, our justice system uh, ensnares people too, right? We have a system that really uh, locks people up oftentimes for unnecessarily long amounts of times. Uh, I have a lot of cousins and uncles, people in my family who've been impacted by the justice system, who've been incarcerated. And I've seen how it makes it harder for them to get gainful employment after they come back home. I know this is happening to a, a lot of people in our city. This is, it locks people in poverty because once you have a record, oftentimes employers don't want to get offer you a job or the only jobs that are available are the ones that are paying seven twenty five an hour, which like we said, is not enough to live on. So we have to, we have to change our justice system too so that it doesn't cause people to get caught up in a, in a system of poverty. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yo. Yo. Hello, uh, I'm Noah Sadiq. Hello, Noah. I'm sorry, I don't really know how to pronounce your last name. What is it? Krajewski. Krajewski, okay. There you go, you got it, right first try. <laughs> Uh, my first question actually was, how do you plan on battling the crippling number of shooting on kids from low income or high minority populated areas? Yeah, this is a this is a big one. Um, you know, it's hard. It's 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 it is a real it's a thing. It's a pandemic. Like you said, it's a pan it's a pandemic that's being that our people are being affected by. And, you know, oftentimes the, the solution that we're told is just having more police, having more surveillance. But to me, right, that doesn't actually address the root causes of violence, that just responds to violence. We need to actually have a plan that is identifying the root causes for why violence and shootings are happening, right? Um, and I think if we do that, some of the things we'll find out is that oftentimes you, you have kids that are struggling around not having adequate mental health resources. Like I said, social workers in the schools that can support kids who might be having a hard time at their family home or in the school itself. Um, part of why the shootings happen too is because of the systemic poverty that our city is dealing with, right? A lot of people uh, aren't able to get a good job <clears throat> over the table. And so sometimes they get caught up in the streets and one thing leads to another and you get caught up in the shooting, right? So if we address poverty, that's gonna be a way for people to, to avoid violence in the first place too. Uh, so to me, it's about, right, we have to address poverty so that Oftentimes people don't end up in situations where they might get caught up in violence. We gotta address mental health issues, right? And make sure that people get the support they need if they're if they're struggling at home or at the school. And, and then just having better schools, right? Having better schools, having better resources so that kids don't just end up being bored, right? Like sometimes, sometimes things just happen because because kids are bored. And if we had better, better programs in schools, kids would would be more occupied. So I think those are a couple of things we can do to address the grass shooting. I believe if you address the problem while it's still small, you wouldn't have to actually work on it before it escalates into something greater. Exactly, 100%, I absolutely like agree. Starting, starting in the schools, getting kids engaged, actually activating the learner inside the child. Right. And instead of just throwing them into something and forcing them to learn something that maybe they don't know or what they don't need, but mm -hmm. they need something else to, evolve and grow inside their own economy mm -hmm. yeah no i absolutely agree like you said i mean as you as you said right like treating treating kids like tr like kids and and figuring out what they need to to thrive uh so i 100 percent agree with that okay my next question is uh how do you plan on helping kids or, or communities that are devastated by the pandemic mm -hmm. the pandemic you, you're referring to covid right specifically yeah. yep yeah, so my campaign has actually been doing stuff right now to, to help people out. So in addition to talking to voters about the election and about uh, voting safely and things like that, we've also been supporting uh, people around uh, what we call mutual aid. So as we talk to people on the phone, we ask questions like, what kind of support do you need? Do you need support around food, around, uh, around like, you know, having protective gear? around getting set up, around vote by mail, you know, navigating some of the online resources for relief and assistance, 
Uh, we've done, we've been doing these kind of calls for two months now. We've done about 40,000 calls so far to, to voters and people in the district. And we've probably gotten a little over 100 requests, maybe 125. Uh, this has been, and it's and oftentimes just been food. So what we'll do is we'll have volunteers who will go. Um, they'll pick up a food box either from the city or some other donation source. And then they will go and drop it off uh, to the family that's in need. Um, we're finding some other food sources too that we can use to do these kind of deliveries. And that's something that, you know, I can do right here, right now. Like I don't have to wait to be a state representative to, to do that kind of work. And so that's actually something that's really distinguished our campaign from the others is that I'm taking action now, right? People, we don't, it's not about waiting three weeks, four weeks, months later until the election's over. Like we're dealing with this pandemic right now. And so we have to figure out how to help the ways that we can. So I've done that with my campaign. The other piece that I've done is we have actually created a, a policy platform that is specifically about addressing COVID. Um, so the mutual aid stuff is important, but also right the our government and specifically our state legislature, which is what I'm running for, has a lot of responsibility uh, when it comes to helping communities. So when it comes to like testing, making sure if communities have access to testing, uh, making sure that renters and homeowners don't have to worry about being evicted or covering their rent or covering their mortgages, because oftentimes that can have people get caught up in and end up in debt. Uh, a lot of people have lost their jobs because of unemployment. They need access to to benefits. They need to have the kind of safety net that they're gonna that they're gonna require to get through that crisis. Um, and then also, right, we we have an issue in our in our justice system right now where you know people are in our jails and in our prisons some some people before they've even been charged with a crime and you know that's they're they're in a closed a closed uh environment while you have a, a a virus spreading right so some of those people need relief too because if we don't address it we can have a real pandemic in some of our jails and prisons as well yeah. so we had a platform we created a platform that specifically calls for demands on each of those things, I can actually drop it into the the chat right now so that you can you can take a look online. Okay. Well, I can guarantee you got my vote. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. I appreciate it. I'm glad to have your vote. You're welcome. Um, hello. I really hate hello. this. You're me. Thanks, Miss Agree. Okay. <laughs> Picture is shit. But um <clears throat> hi Mr. Krajewski. My name is Ayana Frazier. Um I am currently Ayana. here. So my question is, as a person who lives in Pennsylvania all of their lives, I have seen politicians make empty promises towards the African American community to gain their votes. So how are you, even though you do classify as a mixed race man, but how would you you know, be different from the other ones who used African Americans as leverage to gain votes. Yep, yep, that's right. I mean, this is a problem often of our communities being told that their their politicians are going to look out for them, they're going to do things for them, and then they they don't. They leave after election day, right? Mm -hmm. um, what makes me different is that I've I've actually been on the other side of that table, right? I've been a community member and a community organizer that has held politicians accountable to the promises that they make. Um, so an example that I'll offer is, I mentioned working on the election for, for District Attorney Larry Krasner. So I was I actually worked for his campaign. I talked to neighbors, particularly here in, our, in the neighborhood we're in right now, uh, about the election, about why it was important to vote for this person. And I heard firsthand the 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 issues that people cared about around ending cash bail, around changing the justice system, around um, ending the practice of people dying in prison. And when we won the election, in my role as, a, as an organizer, I brought uh, 20 community organizations together that were you know, African-American people. There were also immigrants. Um, there were formerly incarcerated people. We all came together. We met with Larry uh, once he was in office and we, we told him, Here's the platform that you committed to. Here are the pro here are the issues that we are wanting to prioritize, 
and let's come up with a plan to actually make it happen. So we met with him once a month. We met with we met with other heads of his policy departments to talk about specific issues that were on the platform. And we did that regularly for two years. And as a result, many of the things that he campaigned on were actually implemented. Uh, and it's caused real change to our justice system. We just do not put as many people in jail as we used to three, four or five years ago. So that's the kind of thing that we have to do for any politician, myself and everyone else who is in office or is running for office. You, you get them in office, you vote for them, and then you meet with them after they are in and you hold them accountable to the things they say they're gonna do. I am absolutely committed to being that kind of person. I actually will take the initiative to create those kind of spaces, whether it's town hall meetings, uh, meetings with the heads of community organizations, um, having virtual events, because it is important to have actual dialogue with the communities you, you, you choose to represent to make sure that you're in line with what they need. Um, I need that uh, because it is my responsibility. And also like I need it because I need I need y'all to have my back, right? We're going into, uh, I'm going into a, a legislature that oftentimes does not care about many of the issues that our community needs around schools, around funding, around our justice system. And so I need I need people to, to hold me accountable because I also need them to come with me to go yell at these people. So <laughs> so it, I need it. I like you, so I to wait basically to answer that question is, yes, uh, I want to continue to continue meeting and having conversations to hold me accountable uh, because it's going to be a, a, a two way, a two way relationship, you know. All right. I'll keep you to it. Great. Uh, my second one is, this is my actual first year that I'll be able to vote. Um, so, you know, I already have my mind set around who I want to not vote for, who I do want to vote for. So, like, what makes you different for me as a first-time voter to vote yeah. for you? Yeah, well, there are a few things that definitely make me different. One is my commitment to actually doing the work in organizing, as I mentioned even in the midst of the, of the pandemic, I put together a program to help our communities right here, right now. I built a platform specifically addressing COVID. That's the kind of representative I will be if I become state rep in the 188th. Um, I'll be someone who takes the, who goes above and beyond. Uh, because the truth is, is the status quo, the same old, same old hasn't been enough. So if we're gonna put people in office, they have to be people who are gonna go beyond what is generally expected of of politicians and i've demonstrated that i'm someone who will do that um that's one thing that makes me different the other thing that makes me different is i'm i'm young i'm actually the youngest person in the race by about 20 years yeah <laughs> um, i did put that as a question um i was like what made you want to be like such this young politician because yeah. i believe I, I believe you're going to be like the youngest one, two. I'll be one of the youngest. He's either it's either myself or Malcolm Kenyatta. I forget how old Malcolm is, um, but he he's in he represents North Philly and he's in the state house and he's he's around my age. I forget which one of us is younger, but I'll be one of the youngest. Yeah. Right. So, so your question was was why why did I choose to run so so early? Uh yeah, but then like no. So like um, it's just like <laughs> another follow up question, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always have my like my house is a democratic house, but I'm one who leans towards the right side. I am a Republican. So my heart isn't like strictly set on Republican parties, but I do have to get a feel for a lot of people because um, a lot of Democrats, as I saw, kind of like use the whole like LGBT, African American community. Um, any minority groups to kind of leverage their way up into like housing, uh, like in the White House and things like that. They kind of mm -hmm. use like, the underdog status to put themselves up higher and never do uh, what they say they're going to do. They kind of use the minority status to kind of help them get up there and then they never kind of like follow through. So mm -hmm. why is, you know, how should, why should I combat this with you? Why should I? and trust my vote in you as a Republican. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, so the, um, there's one one question I have actually. So are you a registered Republican right now? Yes. Okay. Um, so that's, 
that's that's great. The one thing is um, Pennsylvania is our, our operate as a, it operates as a closed primary. So people who are I'm running in a Democratic primary, and so as part of that, um, people who are in a different registered party can only vote for me in the general election. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one mechanic to know. But I'll say broadly, right? Anyone who is running for the 188th district is running to represent the entire district, right? Not just Democrats, not just not any particular uh, political party, but mm -hmm. we're representing the entirety of the district we're in. Um, for me, right, when it comes to the communities I represent, I don't just I don't just pander to them. I don't just talk to them because of because of wanting to get their vote. And oftentimes I listen first. Uh, many people that that you might talk to about election, who've actually met me know that I, I listen. I listen to the issues. I try to incorporate people's perspectives into the work that I do and the policies that I develop. And that is going to be the necessity for any kind of legislator that is going to represent a district as as diverse as the one that I'm running for in the 188th. So when it comes to my relationship to, to different uh, identities and, and minority groups, um, I'm not just doing it because they're they are some kind of group where I just want to get their vote and never talk to them again. Right. Like I am. I'm, I'm having, I'm bringing those people together because it is going to take all of us to actually have the systemic change necessary for any one of our communities, right? Um, the African community, African American community uh, wants to band together with the LGBTQ community because we're all dealing with discrimina discrimination. Uh, this is the same that goes for the immigrant community and the Latinx community. Uh, mm -hmm. All of us, uh, all of our issues are connected together uh, in that the current system hasn't been working for us in a lot of different ways. And so that's why we need to come together versus wanting to just get their votes so that I can win on election day. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, okay? You too. Take care. My pleasure. Hello, my name is Maya Bloom, and I'm question Hello, Maya. president. And my questions, I changed my questions, so these on the slide, like I edited a little bit. So. Okay. So my first question, the effect of redlining have left a disproportionate amount of African Americans and Latino people in grade D neighborhoods. And instead of trying to better these neighborhoods, people would rather gentrify them. So without using a form of gentrification, how do you plan on combating this issue in the most effective way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important, uh, very important issue here, particularly in West Philly, right? Uh, some of the problems that we are seeing in our in our community is because of the result of redlining, where you had some communities, right, that were told that we that black people were told were off limits, um, and so that often creates many of the issues that we're dealing with right now. Uh, when it comes to addressing the, the inequalities that we see in, in our districts, there are um, a few things that we need to do. I actually see that you address some, you have some answers here that I absolutely agree with, right? One of it is putting more funding into things that low-income ne people need, whether it's affordable housing, uh, putting more money into public housing as well, right? We have public housing that uh, many people rely on that should be just as high quality as any other kind of housing. Um, the, the state legislature can put more funding towards affordable housing. Uh, people that are elected officials can hold developers accountable to putting more affordable housing units in the apartments they develop, particularly here in a district, right, where we have plenty of schools, we have lots of parks, we have Penn, Drexel, the University of Sciences, you have all these things that attract people to come and, and live here in our district. Um, but the people that develop apartments, that develop housing units, they don't make them affordable uh, because they just give it to whoever can pay the most money. So that's one reason why we have so much gentrification because we don't have any regulations on keeping housing affordable for the people that have already lived in these communities, right? Our neighbors, our, our elders. Um, but also keeps it affordable for people that may be wanting to come in to, to live here. So 
In terms of policies, there are a few things, putting funding towards affordable housing, having more funding towards public housing, right, as well. Uh, passing policies like rent control, right? So rent control is a policy that basically states that you can't raise that amount of rent um, for a building or for an apartment to be much to be higher than a certain number based on the income of the people that live in that community. So that's a way of keeping apartments affordable for the people that actually live there and, and can afford to live there. So if we do some of these things, we'll be able to address the gentrification and, and some of the housing inequality that we see coming up in, in our communities. Okay, thank you. And my second question. So there are many white teachers that teach in overpopulated urban schools. So how do we ensure that these white teachers don't have biases towards their students of color? Mm -hmm. How will we start programs that could inform teachers that all students are so-called this way that the media portrayed them to be? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a there's a few reasons why this happens, right? So one one thing is that um, sometimes for particularly for working class uh, black people, um, black people and black and brown people in particular, um, it is hard for us to become teachers because the teachers in our district don't get paid well. <laughs> um, they don't have they don't have the kind of benefits they need. The the salaries are not good enough. Um, so sometimes people who are more working class or more, lo more low income can't necessarily take on those kind of jobs because we don't have access to the same kind of resources that many white middle class or upper middle class people have access to. So that makes these teaching jobs inaccessible for, for a lot of people that, that want to be teachers. So we have to make sure that, that teachers are being paid more appropriately. And it, while we do that, we also have to specifically target hiring more black and, and people of color teachers so that um, students can have people that look like them and have teachers that, that look like them, uh, because that's an important part of someone's learning. The second thing that we have to do is we have to actually have programs, like you said, that can train teachers on understanding the culture and the background of their students. Um, so I think this is, is there's a there's a program that's called cultural competency that specifically is around this issue. So having teachers understand the communities that they're teaching in, uh, both the the culture and the history, but also even the issues that may be arising in those communities, so that when you are coming in to teach these kids, um, when you don't come in with a bias or an assumption, you actually understand. Um, who the people are that you're teaching. So we have to pay jobs, we have to pay teachers better and make sure that we target specifically black and brown teachers to be more in our workforce. We also have to have programs so that um, all teachers understand the, the kids that they're teaching. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's a great question. You're all right. Um, I'm, James. I'm, uh, I'm James Stanton. Uh, my first question is, what do you believe is the most important issue facing us in education today? And how do you plan on resolution? How do you plan on fixing that issue? Yeah, 100 percent. So to me, I think the biggest issue facing our education system is something that I've mentioned a few times already in our conversation is the, the lack of funding not having the appropriate funding for our schools, it trickles down to things like not having teachers paid well enough. It trickles down to not having enough resources, not having enough like books, loose leaf paper, right? Chromebooks, um, not having enough money to put towards keeping up the infrastructure of our schools. Um, the I, I think we have to just have more funding. Um, this, and this goes back for years. When we were dealing with an economic crisis in 2008, one of the ways that our government responded is that they actually cut the funding towards public education, uh, not just through Philly, but through our entire state. So many of the schools are suffering because of that. So we have to address address that issue. Um, one of the ways that we can do that is that the state legislature has a formula that determines how much money is supposed to go towards our public education system. There has been some movement to change that formula so that it more adequately of funds our schools and actually it's an accurate representation of how much money we need 
Um, so I am committed to doing what I can as a legislator to also push to have that formula be changed so that we can get more funding for our schools. Okay, thank you. And my second question is, what are your top priorities for improving the quality and education for public schools? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I mentioned was around having more staff, right? Having more paraprofessionals, having more social workers, um, having people, having smaller class sizes. If we do this, kids can have more individualized attention and then they can also have more um, more support from, from staff throughout their classrooms. And then the other thing that we have to do is we have to just address some of the toxic conditions of our public schools. Um, there are many schools that are dealing with lead in the drinking water, that are dealing with asbestos, um, with old desks, old, 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 um, old classrooms. We, we need to be able to update this, right? Like we are, we are too big of a city that has too much money coming in to not have schools that have modern infrastructure that are clean, that are safe. So I believe that we also have to address the quality of the, the actual health quality of our schools. So making sure there's no lead, there's no, there's no asbestos, that they are, that we have updates to our classrooms, to our, our hallways. And if you do this, right, then also people and, and kids can feel, you can feel more like your environment cares about you. So you care more about your environment, right? You have to, it has to be both ways. So we got to fund it, but we also have to clean up clean up our schools too. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, I think that was actually our final question. Oh, for great. Today. Um, thank you so, so much for taking the time to mm -hmm. talk with us. Yes. Do you else have any final words? <laughs> no, thank you. I have, I, I have one, it's kind of a request. I've been trying to figure out how to do this. Um, I'd love to figure out a way if we can just do like us. I want to do a screenshot that just has all of us on. I don't know if maybe Alexis, you can do this. Yeah. So let me stop sharing my screen and then you'll be able to see everyone. Okay, great. Here we go. Can everyone um, turn on their cameras, please? Let's see. And I know we lost. I, I want to see how do I end up on the screen too? <laughs> On the screen, Everybody I little people matter. <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, I can see you on my screen. You can see me, but I can't see. Uh, trying to figure out how to have us all on it at the same time. How about I take it and send it to you? That'd be great. Yeah, actually, that'd be good. Then you can send that. Um, so maybe we'll, yeah, we, we'll just say, say something on, on three. With some kind of some kind of everyone smile three two one okay i got it <laughs> thank you guys that's great yeah thank y'all i really appreciate our conversation i hope y'all enjoy the rest of your day um and yeah y'all continue to to yeah be safe and be well you too thank you all right Have thank you everyone bye. bye take care